All right, welcome everybody to another installment of the OSPO working group uh, for Chaos. I'm Gary, I'll be driving this session today. So let's start with that first item on the agenda, cms.gov OSPO. Uh, let whoever wrote this put it up. Oh, right off, okay. Uh, so uh, the, the update is uh, that uh, we just got back from All Things Open, and while we were there, our very own uh, U.S. Digital Core fellow, Isaac Malarski, uh, presented about the metrics work that has been done. Uh, we just released a version 2.0 of the site, and it includes the Chaos Lib Years metric. We now have a visualization for that. Um, we're using the Augur API on the back end uh, to gather that information. And uh, there's some links to the uh, the metric itself and the website and the repo in the agenda. But here is the metric. Sure, I can share screen. Oh, oh here, let me, sorry, let me unshare. OK, go for it. <laughs> it's all you, Remy. OK, uh, cool. Let's go here like this and then click the things. All right, so that's the re. Nope, this is the actual site. So we can go and look at an org. So this is the standard sort of GitHub activity that's in the background. And then uh, we have some activity graphs about uh, issues and new issues, top committers across the org. And then uh, this is the new one at the bottom. Uh, lib years is short for uh, library years of technical debt. Uh, it is a chaos is, uh, metric. Yeah, it's a chaos metric. Uh, so folks probably are aware of it on this call, but if you are not, uh, this looks at all the repos in an order and then adds up all of the technical debt of the dependencies in those. Um, there are some limitations, which is an early version. Um, Augur only supports, I believe, package.json and requirements.txt. Uh, those are not the only kinds of packages and package lists that are out it, there. So. It, yeah, it's, it supports, uh, the Libyars package is supporting Node, and um, which is the package.json. It does, as I understand it, it does support all of the various, like eight different ways Python lets you declare dependencies. Nice. Um, <clears throat> I thought like Isaac. Setup, I know it covers setup.py and requirements, and I think it covers a few other things. There's a new one. I think poetry is uh, poetry <laughs> files, and uh, I think Isaac is looking into sending a patch for that upstream. But awesome. uh, currently, uh, this is what is supported. Uh, we have it on the uh, on the org level, and I believe we also have it on the repository level as well. So if we go into like projects. We can look at like uh, we'll look at our own metrics website. So you can see the same sort of graphs about like activity and issues. We have a few extra ones about like days to first response. We now have like line complexity, so we can tell you like composition of lines of code, um, number of contributors that have joined. Uh, this is some new work that was recently contributed by our digital core fellows, uh, Dina and Sachin doing a summary of the language composition by source code lines. And you can sort of see it as a pie chart or as like a bar graph of what is there. Um, average resolution time is a new one that we have. Um, we're also looking into sending some patches upstream in the PyGals library to reverse the direction of the numbers. Right now it goes from big to little. It's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, I guess this is a bad example, but also a good example because there are zero years of technical debt in the uh, metrics project right now. Um, another one that's perhaps interesting to this group that we may not have talked about or may have is um, dryness score. So doing a Kokomo analysis, you can dry is short for don't repeat yourself. So we can see sort of the unique lines of code over the entire source lines of code. And that can give you a sense of like what the composition of the library is like. And then uh, Kokomo analysis, we recently, uh, this is the first version of, uh, we peg it based on the GS scale of pay. So this is a GS9 level, and I believe this goes up to a GS15 level, and these are configurable so that we can uh, put in whatever salaries for, for source code 
uh, uh, developer salaries we want. And then uh, this is a, a first version of a graph as well that pulls the time estimated for developing. So these are all generated on a weekly basis. Uh, we use GitHub Actions and static site generation to produce these graphs. So we generate PyGals graphs and then they go into uh, markdown templates and then they are shipped to our GitHub Pages site. So these should be fresh every week. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, continuing to build out some of the uh, metrics uh, front end and back end, uh, continuing to collaborate with the Augur project to do so. And uh, that's what we wanted to share today. That's very cool. I really like the github.io deployments of these tools, Remy. It makes it visible and accessible to people in, uh, in ways that are less, you know, there's a slight dependence on Augur, but it's not as, I don't think it's as tightly coupled as some of the other things we see. So it's, there's a degree of utility that Augur provides, but the way you're presenting it is very stable. Yeah, and you know it's really important to uh, have, you know, the static websites are are really useful for keeping costs low as well. A lot of open source projects don't have hosting budget resources, etc., and you're already hosting your source code on GitHub anyway. So that is a, yep. a nice feature to be able to keep the barrier to entry low and the maintenance costs low, um, but it does require some like. Uh, interesting uh, hacks around things like relative and absolute paths and a little bit of playing around with uh, some of the URL structure, but it's it's something that we're getting better at all the time. And that's a link to the, uh, the metrics repo we were just looking at in case anybody wants to see that. And you can just like go back to just the org level uh, if you want to see at the org. Uh, this is our OSPOs. Um, metrics as a whole was the first graphs I was showing. Yeah. So let me make sure I didn't put anything else in the agenda. I think that's it. Um, yeah. So we're going to be uh, doing some redesign and um, hopefully building this stuff out a little bit more uh, in the coming quarters. But we're we're happy with the baseline. Lib years across orgs is a, is a big milestone. So uh, we're hoping to get that to be more accurate and useful and uh, deliver that to different parts of our organization to help reduce our risk at the agency. And I'll pass it back to Dawn. Or Gary, because he's driving. Hi. Or Gary. Uh, yeah, I mean, I am astounded. I'm clicking through this thing because it's so interesting. Um, I'm really excited about the static generation of graphs because that was something I haven't considered as somebody who's also looking at putting metrics together and presenting them. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, the next item on this agenda is Augur 8 Knot. Yeah, so I think uh, this agenda item exists uh, for the primary purpose of pointing out to people that you can go to the metrics.chaos.io link Add, create a user, add the repositories that you care about within two to three days, that data will be available to you uh, in your logged in instance, in your logged in account, and you'll be able to see, you know, be able to see some basic uh, visualizations in 8Knot. So that's the first thing, because I think, Don, you pointed out that not everybody knew that anybody could go in and do that. Yeah, we talk a lot about how to install our tools and, and and using our tools and a bunch of us had given demos uh, like I've given loads of demos of, of eight not to various people and at conferences and, and things and yeah and this person has seen lots of those and they didn't realize that they too could use this link to generate their own visualizations so I just wanted to raise that visibility a bit and then the um in terms of deploying Ocker yourself I think there's been a little bit of um, historical brittleness in the dockerization of it. And Greg Sutcliffe at Red Hat is working with us now to um, enhance and stabilize all the dockerization stuff. In fact, he's able to make it work relatively easily now with the current configuration. So I think it's um, just making it available in Podman and uh, updating uh, some of the instructions and expectations that people might have. Awesome. Very cool. So yeah, no, that's yeah, Gary. 
that would be of interest to you, I think. <laughs> and your your uh, your prior contributions to Docker on Augur are are significant for this ability this this thing moving forward now because you fixed some major issues around RabbitMQ for us. Thank you. Tried to. No worries. Happy to help. Um, Anything else on Augur 8 now? Any questions, any thoughts, feelings, hopes, dreams? So, Sean, people want to add repositories. Where do they do that on the interface? You just hit the log. You have to, you have to create an account. Okay. Um, and then once you create an account, you'll, get, you'll see in the upper right, manage repositories. Yep, I see that. Okay. And so if you click on that, that actually does jump you over to an instance of Augur mm -hmm. where you would create repository groups and add repository or you know github organizations gitlab urls uh, github repositories okay uh, to the groups that you know you could either put them all in the default group or you could create groups for things that you care about depending on you know really usually it depends on the scale of what you're trying to collect so if you've got 20 repos you're interested in you're probably not going to create your own groups for them you're probably just going to put them in default. Okay. Uh, but if you've got a thousand, that's where, you know, at some point between a hundred and a thousand uh, people will want to group things. <laughs> yeah. And don't, don't overload it. Don't add too many repositories until yeah. we sort ourselves out. We got some changes coming. Uh, one yeah. thing I want to point out. So a lot of people, you look at this first screen, you see this stuff at the top and you start clicking on things, but all of the instructions are right here. So you just scroll down a little bit and it has loads of details about how to use 8-Knot, how it works. But the important part is the logging into Augur. So it runs you through step by step exactly what you need to do to, um, to log in. And then the creating project groups shows you how to add repositories and organizations. So they've got really good instructions that are just a little, you just have to scroll a little bit to get to them. Yeah. Uh, Remy, sorry, I think I jumped over you no you're fine you sort of uh you know pre-answered my question i think but it when i click the the access it says you know authorizing the application will grant it access to the following thing does that mean on github or does that mean in augur mm, that means in augur okay cool that's all i wanted to know thank you All right. Anything else on our awesome Augur instances? Uh, I see actually that David that is, is having an unauthorized something going on when trying to create an account. Hmm. All right. Yep. I get that error. And Raymond. Can I'll you drop a, a uh, Can you drop a screenshot in the uh, working group dash Augur eight knot channel in Slack? Just so that people can see what the what the issue is. Sorry, where? Help. There's a Slack channel called um, WG dash Augur dash eight knot. Okay. And that's probably the best place to report any issues. All yeah. right. We'll direct it, that conversation. It, oh. Two more, two more comments. So, Sean, when people add repositories, for example, like yeah. once they've created an account, do, are those then public? publicly available for everybody, or are they just tied to that account? The data sure. that's collected. Um, they will, the way that it's, the way that it works is um, if I add them under my account, so there's one account that owns the relationship mm -hmm. and under that account, um, I, everyone will see what I enter, but under your account, only you will see what you create under your account. Unless another person like me has created a parallel group. So if let me just summarize that if I um, if I add Kubernetes to um, to this instance, everyone can access the Kubernetes data, but nobody will know that I added Kubernetes to the instance. So the the repos themselves are going to be public. Anybody else can look yeah. at them. Okay. The and utility of the login is it narrows the scope of repositories you look at to only those you care about. I see. Okay. But as soon and as I do you see the unauthorized issue, by the way, I'll fix that. 
okay, but I got you done. So as soon as somebody adds that, it becomes available for everybody. So like the collection doesn't have to, I don't know, once the collection is done then it's essentially done and available for everybody. Yeah, okay. and that lets us have it, you know, if, the, if somebody's already chosen to collect data on Kubernetes is a good example, then when you add that to your group, the data is there for you right away. You don't have and to every, wait. And every, okay, gotcha. And then um, when you had said, Sean, that like making, like doing this publicly for people like making it available for them to add repositories increases work for you. What, why does that increase work for you? What is the overhead that you incur on that? What's the, add people adding repositories? Well, or like, I felt like early in the conversation, um, Don had said that a lot of people don't know that this is a service available. And then you had said that Making I haven't been I haven't been promoting it because it's I've, I had the actual hosting of it's in a transitional state. So the more stuff okay. that gets added, the yeah. longer and more complicated it is to move. I see. You okay. know, the amount of data as it grows takes longer to move it across different servers and, and sort of reconfigure it. So really just trying to keep the switching costs low. OK, I gotcha. Yeah, and we've also it, we've also in the past had the issue that when Sean talks about this at big conferences, all of a mm -hmm. sudden people are adding tens of thousands of repo of repositories. Okay, which, I mentioned uh, it at OSS. Kind of and bring a, things to a a halt. It kind of, it's too much at once. After after OSS NA, there were fifty thousand new repositories added to the public instance, which is is, is good. It's cool, but <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool. But you know, I had to, it, you know, I, I then had to. It did take a good deal of time to. Um, work through that. Okay. Um, just to, to, you know, basically that revealed like data collection efficiencies and data rotation collection efficiency, you know, just revealed a bunch of stuff that hmm. didn't gotcha. come up until we instantly doubled the size of what we were doing. I gotcha. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. More thoughts or questions for Sean about Augur. Okay, let's move along. Uh, Relicensing slash forks research, now an academic paper for OFA. Woo! So uh, at the, in the last meeting, I gave a little presentation about the work that we've done on the um, forks and relicensing project. And uh, believe it or not, since then, there was a cancellation in um, the Open Forum Academy conference and they asked me they said and they asked me this like a week and a half ago can you um if we accept your talk can you have an academic paper for us in a week and a half um so so i did um and that is that is this and i've had loads of really amazing feedback from people within the chaos community so i just wanted to highlight that um if you want to read more about the forks and relicensing data in a more um academic fashion um, have a have a look, and if you if you see anything wrong with it or want to provide feedback, just just let me know. So the paper is is done in that I needed to submit it today, um, but I don't have to have the final version to them until next week. So so I can still make a few a few tweaks to it in the meantime. But uh, there's a lot of interest in it when I presented it last uh, two weeks ago. So I thought I'd just mention that we do we do have this now. Is it on the schedule, you know? Did they change it? I didn't look. Yeah, it's on the schedule. Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay, the only thing I will mention is that um, also this is uh, kind of ongoing research. So if you click on if you click on this link, there's you know things that you can help with. So we've got, um, this is something that we're gonna work on over the coming months. Cause right now, the only bit that I've really done is the organizational affiliation analysis for the projects that we're looking at as kind of case studies. But we need to, we need to add a lot of metrics. I know Chan Bong is, in, is um, helping out with some of that. So there's, there's a lot more work to do, um, both from a metric standpoint and just a writing standpoint. So the, the work that we'll do in the future is, is not an academic paper. It's more of a research report. So think like the, 
the research reports that the LF puts out or or something something more like that, where it'll be a, a report that talks about all of this in a non-academic fashion. So this is something that really anybody who's interested can help out with. Awesome. And I see it's part of the data science working group, so we can probably attend that if we want to learn more, huh? Yes, absolutely. All right. Any other thoughts? Any other questions, things people want to share about this? All right. Uh, so I added this agenda item of what's on your minds, what's been going on in your OSPOs, because it's getting towards the end of the year. Uh, I know Q4 deliverables are coming and a lot of folks take time to focus on that when we're talking about corporate OSPOs, maybe. Um, there's probably some crunch time that keeps folks from either attending or putting in some agenda items. And so I wanted to ask if anybody has things going on that they feel like they would like to be represented in this group, topics and uh, ways that we can engage the community, because I want to do everything that we can to talk about things that folks want to hear about and stir conversation about those kind of things. So I put this in. Any thoughts of or things people want to share that's been going on in their OSPOs? Okay, I'll take enough dead air to mean not a whole lot of thoughts on this uh, at this point. Hospital, Gary. Yeah, I, I mean, I can talk about what's going on. I have been uh, spending a lot of time uh, avoiding via beam, not by choice, uh, but by organizational mandate to focus on infrastructure. So looking at getting those uh, viability starter metrics and the viability metrics models into a beam pipeline is taking a little bit longer than I want it to. Uh, we've had, uh, as I'm sure many OSPOs have been dealing with, just a lot of like restructuring following a weird year of tech. Uh, and that means a lot of recalculating of the metrics that we track internally. And that's just been a lot of work to keep up with. And we released one of our first little internal products for tracking licensing information. So that's been taking up quite a bit of my time. Uh, but yeah, it's certainly been exciting. It's certainly been things I think we talk about licensing in this forum quite a bit. We talk about different responsibilities that OSPOs have, uh, but nothing that I felt was novel enough or publicly shareable enough that I could bring it up in this forum. What, um, can you talk about the, what you're doing license tracking? So is it like on inbound code that you're trying to do discovery or no yeah more it's, a, it's a little bit of both um and it's a it's a like connected reason to viability that we have a component review portal where people can say i'd like to know whether or not i should use this component is it viable is it license compliant with what i want to do and then we have our legal team review it with us as well as a viability assessment that i'm doing by going and pulling up the chaos metrics and looking at the repo and kind of comparing and contrasting and saying, this is good, this is good, this is good, this is not good. Uh, and then there is a second effort that by itself, we track licensing that exists on projects that are already uh, within our company. And then based on how it's being used, based on if it's gonna wind up on a mobile device, based on if it's gonna wind up somewhere else, uh, we approach teams and start a conversation about uh, licensing and what they should consider for that particular distribution um, expectation per application. And then that can get specific enough with components as we go, but that's like something that we're doing as a second step. So it's like a lot of engagement and a lot of like talking to people and tracking what that effort looks like and then presenting at the top level, here's how that effort's going and then doing it again and then presenting at the top level, here's how that effort's going. How much of that is automated? Like, I can't imagine you can do all that at scale with just people, but maybe you can. Uh, no, I mean, legal things are almost never automatable uh, because then you're automating kind of like privilege. Uh, and then there are some things that we can say pretty definitively, uh, like permissive licenses are usually fine. 
um, but then non-permissive licenses we, we will flag and start a conversation about. Uh, that's why I want, I, I think viability and security feel like fruit that we can probably pick more easily, where if we can get a good viability assessment based on a gradient of this is the least viable, this is the most viable in your portfolio, and this thing that you want to include falls above the 50th percentile or below the 50th percentile, that's an easier conversation to have. Um, part of the reason why I want it to be like something that I, I can fully automate. Can you, is there, maybe not now, but on the viability stuff that you're doing, like looking at the different projects that are available, or maybe even the projects that are currently being used to understand their viability, is there anything you can share about how you're doing that? Like the processes or what you're automating in that? Cause I would, I'm asking because I've been thinking quite a bit about open source supply chains and just trying to understand certain parts of that supply chain mm -hmm. I think viability might be one of them, but I haven't really thought about how we could do that in an automated way. Yeah. I mean, uh, Sean and I spent a lot of time talking about this with Augur, uh, and eight not, and that's how I decided, or it's how I determined that I via beam needed to be created, uh, definitely more conversation to be had when that is present and we're collecting data on it because it's intended to be um, something that can be portable from your laptop to a deployment uh, where we can do batch processing of massive amounts of information that we need to extract from github or wherever uh, but that's question mark of um, how effective is that going to be at scale how can we do data checkpointing and then what can we actually glean from that information? Um, I think that's all going to be, uh, there are some things that you can do that don't involve like community health metrics, but I don't think that's like what we're talking about in this working group. Okay. Well, I'd love to see how that progresses and get updates on that. That'd be cool. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think the effort, correct me if I'm wrong, Gary, but the idea is to take some of the functionality that exists inside of Augur and maybe leverage some of the ideas or logic and put it into something that's far more componentized and piecemeal yeah. so that instead of this giant thing that gets all the things, you have lots of little things that perhaps ultimately could be glued together. That's in the long run, a better software architecture, and we all know it. <laughs> Well, yeah, and it, it's, uh, we don't want to overload our service account threshold, or I'm sorry, what would you call it? I guess like your GitHub token threshold by collecting 80% metrics that you may never use and 20% right. metrics that you need yesterday. Uh, that was yeah. kind of the issue that I kept running into because we're also talking about a scale of hundreds of thousands of individual projects that we want to assess. And so, um, Sean, the problems you're running into running 50,000 extra all at one time, absolutely ditto. It was a lot of the problem that I was running into trying to get yeah. for the same thing. No, uh, yeah, we, we got through mo there's one lingering thing that we have to deal with, which is related to if people are using their API key in more than one place, uh, try to prevent that from being a accidental, uh, jumping off of a bridge for your auger instance problem, mm -hmm. uh, which which it can be, you know, so trying to make Absolutely. that more visible to people when they're overusing their keys and starving their auger instance. Yeah. And so Matt, uh, getting back to like how I think, or one way that I would like this to be used and, and bring it to what Sean had just said, uh, if you want to know community health metrics for a given metrics model about a given project, I think that will be significantly easier to do with something like Viabeam because you can say, I just need to know this about this project and the public, uh, you know, not even tokenized amount of calls that that might take from GitHub is probably not going to overload it. Uh, but then even if you have to punch in a developer token, a single project I can't imagine, in fact, I know does not overwhelm the amount of metrics that we need to get. All right, cool, thank you. But it also doesn't get as much clarity, I think, as you would get from punching it into like metrics.chaos.io because you get plenty of graphs and um, a lot more of the metrics that we wouldn't be collecting for a specific metrics model.
that's like that contrast because we had kind of a similar thing happen with Grimoire Lab. Yeah, I could talk about Viabeam all day, uh, but it doesn't like work yet. And so it feels weird to bring it up in this meeting. Like I'm still working on it. Um, if you were a software company, you'd already be asking us for a million dollars for it. <laughs> <laughs> and pretending like it was functioning. Yeah, yeah. I, I can say it does things, right? <laughs> um, we've all been there. Vaporware presentations, yes, we have. The other thing I want I want to cycle back to is is this question that Gary put on there. You know what what's what's on your mind? What's been going on in your ospos? Let me ask a, a different question: Is are there any topics that you would like for us to talk about in this meeting that we that you don't necessarily want to talk about? Because I feel like sometimes people don't necessarily want to volunteer topics um, because then they know that they're probably going to have to talk about it. Um, but are there are there things that you would be interested in hearing about in this meeting that we could go off and find someone who could come talk to us about it? Are there any kind of, I don't know, OSPO metrics sort of things that you would like to know more about, SBOMs, uh, you know, I don't know, what whatever. Remy. So... Our team is looking more into archival right now and 508 and some other things that are less repository centric, but more like process, accessibility, things like that. Uh, we have an archival checklist and a 508 checklist that we're going to be publishing soon. They're almost ready. Uh, so maybe by the time we sit down in the next meeting, uh, we can share what we have, but that's more of like a how do you what are the mechanics of doing it but less so about like what metrics will give us clues about like how accessible something is or how uh active or inactive something might be so i'm um, tying those into metrics could be a good next version to add later Just yeah that would be that would be a good topic to talk about i mean it was something we we spent a lot of time at when i was at vmware looking at what we called sunsetting projects um basically archiving them and things there were things metrics that we looked at when we made the decision of yes we could archive something no we couldn't or what would we what would we need to do based on based on some of the some of the data and my question for you Remy is I don't know what 508 means ah yes so um 508 is section 508 of some government regulation that talks about the accessibility of documents so uh, let me see if I can find the URL. In standard Fed fashion, I've already forgotten uh, what section 508.gov, uh, where you can read more about it. Um, yeah, general, thank you. That's yep. helpful. Yeah. And there's also uh, plainlanguage.gov is another one that is out there that isn't necessarily just for like uh, accessibility, but also like readability and cognitive read, uh, you know, type of uh, accessibility and inclusion stuff too. So those are both things that we're going to be exploring how we can tie metrics into uh, our repository hygiene standards and templates uh, in the coming quarters. Awesome, thank you. Uh, David, you've got your hand up. I'm I'm relatively new in 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 these calls and new as an creating and trying to create an OSPO in the university, and I'm kind of joining different calls. But one of the things that I find it uh, difficult is there's a, like yeah a lot of a lot lot of tools are mentioned, a lot of things are mentioned, but it's like where do I start? How like what are the things that are more uh, easy to set up or easy to to get the thing rolling because yeah I get confused with all the large list of metrics I but how I get them or for example what Remy was showing at the beginning uh, today like is that something I can deploy here or I, I guess I got lost a little bit on on the things or what uh, Sean was mentioning as well uh, from the K8 thing that I couldn't log in but yeah so I don't know I say I say what are the things that a new OSPO could 
benefit from and how other people are using it i suppose that that's my my question or my yeah yeah, that's a really good question. I think that that's that's been something that's cha been challenging. I think about about this meeting is that um, we have people in this meeting who are interested in OSPOs. We have people who are just starting OSPOs, and then we have other people like like Remy who's been doing this OSPO thing for more years than I can count. Um, so we have we have kind of all all the extremes really, um, and it it is. It is hard, and we. I think we do get maybe a little bit. I don't know inside baseball where we um, don't necessarily talk about uh, some of the more fundamental concepts, which maybe we maybe we should take some more time on some of those. Yeah, that's a really good one. I see. Yeah, I think don't be don't be shy about saying here's what I'm trying to do in my ASPO. Here's the kind of stuff I need. Because you could also treat this like uh, instead of us, like Don said, talking inside baseball, you could treat this as uh, people have dealt with many of the same questions who might be able to talk through some things with you, even, in, you know, even if that's not what we've been doing, I think that can happen here. Yeah, you know what, we used to do a lot more of that. I think in this meeting um, and and lately we, we haven't done as much of it, but I think when we first started this this working group that was a lot of what the agenda items were we you know somebody somebody would come in and they'd say hey we're trying to do this in our ospo does anybody have any suggestions how have you done this what have you what have you done um and so yeah this is this is actually a really good place to bring up challenges because like i said you've got you've got people in here who've been doing this for for quite a long time who can maybe provide some some pointers to things that have worked for them and their ospos in the past And just Absolutely. as a reminder, anyone can add anything they want to the agenda. So if you have a question and you want some feedback, um, just just drop it in the agenda, drop it in the Slack channel, whatever's whatever's easiest for you. We'll make sure that it makes its way to to a discussion. Absolutely. And I saw Alyssa, you had posted something in chat that feels similar to what we were just talking about. Uh, foundational and basic, but always looking for ways to measure the value or ROI of open source solutions versus proprietary choices. It's a pretty good suggestion. Yeah, that's uh, you know a content frame that I'm I'm thinking about, um, and and appreciate <clears throat> um, how people are solving that problem and, and metrics models to support that. Yeah, on the on the topic of demonstrating value, that's actually one of the next practitioner guides that we're getting ready to work on. So Bob Bob Killen, who used to work at Google and who's now at the CNCF, um, has done several really nice talks about um, demonstrating the value of your open source work. And so we are getting ready to do a practitioner guide around that. So. We we wanted to start it a month or so ago, and we've both gotten sidetracked with other things. So we've we've committed to meeting up again at LF Member Summit and and getting started on it again. But uh, that's something we'd be definitely interested in in feedback and interested in, in help with. Yeah, I'll be there too um, for my first LF Summit. So happy to to meet and talk. Um, I mean, mm. one of the things that I find difficult is that I I personally don't have the information. Like, uh, like, visible to me to 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 provide this value in, in ROI. So I depend on other people, but I don't know. Um, and they're self-generating information and numbers, and so I don't really know. It would be really great to have like a list of questions to ask, like my stakeholders to be like, "Can you tell me how many X, Y, and Z we have?" Like, and I don't know how to I don't know how to measure uh, things to provide value value. So I'm really I re I really I feel like I really rely on other people, um, and 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 with that struggle, don't get that like value, valuable information because it's not their top priority either. So so we just end up in being like, oh, I'll get to that soon. 
is the is the state of affairs. I just dropped a link in the chat, which is um, Bob's uh, talk from it was from a from a KubeCon, and so that that link has the the video, and he does some really interesting, really interesting. Which one? Things this this link right here. Oh, I, it's in the notes. Okay. Yeah, it's in the notes. Here, I can drop it in the chat. If that's easier for you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, but it was it was a really good talk, and he does he does some really interesting. Um, he looks at the data in, in interesting ways. I think that um, might be might be helpful for you. Thank you. Yeah, and Damien, uh, I see your comment that sometimes it feels less intimidating because to do does not record their OSPO uh, meetings. Yeah, I was talking in particular about the random subjects, like for the agenda thing, someone comes prepare, <laughs> but for going into what is your OSPO doing and those kind of things is being so formal is harder <laughs> to, to manage. Uh, I see the other one having a lot more participation in that sense because of the chat hand rules and not recording and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's, um, sorry, go ahead, Don. Oh, no, go ahead, Gary. I was going to say, uh, it's something I spent quite a bit of time uh, internally clearing that I could come to these meetings and that I could talk about things that are happening at Verizon and what those parameters around that conversation are, uh, because it, it certainly gets harder. I'm sure Remy, as a government employee, you are taking uh, care not to share things that you're not supposed to. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the same considerations have to come from corporate ospos. Yeah, it's an art. I think that the more ospos sit in this very interesting bridge position where you do have access to internal things, but your audience also is outside and learning how to hold that space where you keep the internal things internal while also sharing what needs to be external is is its own skill set uh moving from the purely wide open world of a linux distribution where literally everything was on the internet to a more corporate environment that was a skill that i think as an ospo employee or participant or contributor you sort of learn as you go along but um the more you do it, the easier it gets. Uh, now I'm in this other weird position where I'm like a government employee. So like everything is FOIAable at some point. So I'm just like pre foia all of the things I'm doing anyway. <laughs> they bust paperwork in the long run. So, you know, my attitude towards it has changed a bit. But um, yeah, it's a really good point. And I would also add that I've had other contributors as well who have said that like they didn't know that the meeting was going to be recorded and, you know, not everyone is super comfortable with it. They, you know, it's, it's definitely come up as a, as a thing that I've heard personally too. Um, I try to, I think on balance, it's worth it to have these things out there and on the record in public because we're trying to grow this community, but you know, it is worth mentioning. And I'm, I appreciate you Damien for bringing it up that, you know, it is, it is a cost. It is a friction for the community and it's worth mentioning. Yeah, I, what I think is like this particular meeting, like if we want to make it more like about more random stuff, my encourage to have non-recorded version, all the others that are more formal, I, I think it makes sense to keep them like they are, but I don't know. Yeah, it's a special set of skills. Like I, I feel comfortable at this point with it, but I know it's not comfortable for everyone mm. and also in my personal thing when I go to the other one sometimes I talk about my opinions about things and uh, because it's not recorded I don't have to prefix like something saying like this is my personal opinion it's not my employer blah 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 like you do when you post in GitHub or uh, in Twitter and because everyone knows that yeah, this is your opinion of my problem. And um, when it's in recording, it's like, should I give my opinion? Should I say like these things like 
this is my personal opinion, it's not my employers or blah, blah, blah mm -hmm. thing. That, that kind of thing, uh, I feel I navigate it now, but it doesn't encourage new participation for sure. Okay, we are we are running out of time. We're actually a minute over. Um, I will point out what Matt said in the chat as chaos community. Um, you know, we we could change the parameters for a meeting. We could actually try Chatham House rules for a couple of meetings and see see what people what people think. Um, that's that's certainly a possibility. So um, Gary, maybe we can sync up offline and, and talk about what we might want to try. Yep, um, the, other, the other quick question I had for people, um, how many people are going to be around for the meeting on the on the 14th? I'm going to be at the Open Forum Academy in Boston, along with Matt. I'll be here. <clears throat> okay. Okay. It sounds like it's probably just me and Matt. So, so Gary, Gary, you're in charge of the next one. Oh, boy. I'm driving. <laughs> The one They're after driving. that is on Thanksgiving, so. Well, we'll cancel yeah, that. Yeah, we won't be meeting then. <laughs> might might be busy at that time. Yeah, I imagine after this next meeting, we'll be in the winter break for chaos pretty soon, anyway. Yeah. All right. Oh, Remy, I dropped a bunch of the links about sunsetting projects here into the minute. So, if you want to have a look there. Cool. All right. All right. Off to my next meeting. See y'all. See yeah. everybody. Thanks, everybody. Wow. Oh.